Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is conventional wisdom isn't always that smart. Sometimes it gets things very wrong. Sometimes it is simply a way of justifying preconceived notions. Who, for example, would have thought that there would be or could be a significant group of people living in Iran who vocally and actively support Israel. Hashtag we stand with Israel is the Twitter hashtag that Iranian supporters of Israel living in Iran use to show defiance against Iranian leadership and their support for Israel. These Iranians tweet about their love of Israel even though Twitter itself has been banned in Iran. They put their lives and the lives of their families at risk in order to show their support for the Jewish state. Tweeting isn't their only way of demonstrating support. Made up of mostly young men and women, this group is actively involved in cyber demonstrations and protests. Their cause has gained traction in Iran. Their voices are heard not only by their fellow Iranians in Iran, but also by expats, Iranians that are living abroad, diplomats, analysts, monitoring events in Iran, and many others. El Quds, in both Arabic and Persian, is the name for Jerusalem. El Quds Day is the official annual day dedicated to condemning Israel in Iran. On that day, Iranian leadership officially sponsor and sanctioned marches during which Israel is burned in effigy and Israeli flags are torched. On that same day, tens of thousands of Iranians hashtagged, we stand with Israel. This counteraction was planned in advance. Lovers of Israel composed an ad, posted it on Twitter. Their ad displayed two painted hands, one hand painted as an Iranian flag, the other as an Israeli flag. The hands came together to shape a heart. The top of the announcement read, hashtag we stand with Israel. At the bottom was the time and the date of the event in English and in Farsi, which is Persian. The time was 9 p.m. in Tehran. At the very moment, tens of thousands of people rejected the message sent out by their leaders, instead of proclaiming on social media that they love Israel. Some daring Iranians even wrote a message on their hands in English and took a photo to post it on Twitter. Israel is keenly aware of their influence on Iranians. The Israeli government has its own Twitter feed directed at Iran and written in Farsi. That account has 62,000 followers. The feed reaches over a million people on a normal week. And during the week of El Quds Day, as many as 2.5 million readers joined. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has on several occasions spoken directly to the Iranian people. He did it again just recently, and the Iranians responded very positively. The Prime Minister of Israel released a video which spoke to an issue on the hearts and in the minds of all Iranians. Not just those who support Israel. He spoke about water. Netanyahu explained that Israel was going to post on the internet a method by which Iranians could purify and reuse water. He was helping to save Iranian lives. Every Iranian is acutely aware of the water shortage in their country. According to estimates, 50 million Iranians will suffer from a lack of water. Actually, 96% of the topographical area of Iran suffers from a lack of water. Netanyahu explained that Israel is creating, a, and he said this on a YouTube video, quote, a Farsi website with detailed plans on how Iranians can recycle their wastewater. We will show how Iranian farmers can save their crops and feed their families, unquote. In his inimitable way, Netanyahu compared Jewish Israeli leadership to Iranian leadership by quipping, and this is his, these are his words, the Iranian regime shouts death to Israel. In response, Israel retorts, life to the Iranian people. The people of Iran are good and decent. They shouldn't have to face such a cruel regime alone. We are with you. We will help so that millions of Iranians don't have to suffer. The hatred of Iran's regime will not stop the respect and friendship between our two peoples." Unquote. These young revolutionaries of Iran lend hope for the future. The supreme leader still controls his country with an iron fist. But this, is, this growing group is standing strong for a cause in which they believe a cause that goes against everything that they have been taught their entire lives. Despite their national and religious leaders, who rant and rave and have gone as far as to proclaim a modern day commandment to destroy the Jewish state, a growing group has emerged to challenge that status quo. If these voices gain traction, 
there is a future for Iran. I've also been thinking about a member of the City Council of Johannesburg in South Africa. She announced that she was a friend of Israel. Mafo Falazzi also said that the city of Johannesburg stood together with Israel. And because she made those statements, Falazzi has been suspended from the city council. For many South Africans, mere suspension seemed insufficient. There were cries for a firing, but the mayor of Johannesburg prevailed and his underling was suspended until she issued a public apology. Mofso Falazzi holds the city profile for health and social development. The story is not ancient history. It just happened. An elected official was censured for demonstrating support of Israel. And it happened in a country that proclaims to be a democracy, not a Muslim or an Arab country, not a theocracy, not a small country we've hardly heard about or know anything about. And she wasn't even speaking at an official city event. Mofo Falazzi dared to speak of her support for Israel at a private pro-Israel event sponsored by the Jewish community of Johannesburg. It is a comedy of the absurd. These are the words she dared to utter that caused such an uproar in that South African city. And I'm quoting here. I would like to declare that I am a friend of Israel, and the city of Johannesburg is a friend of Israel. Shalom. Unquote. That's it. And it keeps getting even more absurd. When he announced the suspension of Councilwoman Falazzi, Johannesburg Mayor Herman Mashaba said that her, quote, remarks did not adequately address the complexity and sensitivity of the issue. They caused confusion, unquote. Falazzi made an apology, and her apology goes to the heart of the matter. Pay attention to her wording. I'm speaking, uh, these are her words. I would like to issue my most sincere apology to the residents of the city of Johannesburg for the confusion and hurt caused by my remarks. The nature of the Middle East conflict is a very challenging and sensitive subject which, if not approached with the required consideration, causes acrimony in our diverse society. In the unpublicized component of my speech, I specifically spoke to the commitment of the DA, the Democratic Alliance, and our government to achieving freedom, fairness, opportunity, and diversity in Johannesburg. This led to a lot of confusion, and I realized that many were offended as a result. She continued on, referencing the highly publicized statement in isolation, does create the impression that I was positioning the city of Johannesburg on international relations matters without the requisite mandate, and for that I sincerely apologize. In conclusion, Falazzi actually explained that the department she runs is dedicated to peaceful interaction. It is the role of the Department of Social Development to foster peaceful relations and the social cohesion between all residents in the city. And this is a cause I remain committed to. Anti-Semitism takes many shapes and exists in many forms. Institutional anti-Semitism is one of the most dastardly. When the system is set up to breathe and foster and perpetuate anti-Semitism, institutional anti-Semitism creates an environment where hatred of Israel and Jews is an acceptable norm. In such a system, there is a gentleman's agreement, as in the famous 1947 movie called Gentleman's Agreement starring Gregory Peck. Which won, of, which won three Oscars, by the way, that Jews and Israel are simply not permitted, that society sets standards and Jews are not allowed to participate. The irony that this current episode is taking place in South Africa with all its history of racism is even more striking. For many anti-Semites, the anti-Israel mantle is nothing more than a veneer covering their true anti-Semitic inclinations. In today's world, being anti-Israel is more politically correct and acceptable than being anti-Semitic. Those who are guilty of this PC anti-Semitism do not want Israel to challenge their policies. Those who are guilty of this PC anti-Semitism do not want Israel to change their policies. They don't care about her policies. They, plain and simple, do not want Israel to exist. Their solution to the complexity is to eliminate Israel. And that will solve the problem. When governments and institutions adopt this approach to Israel, it shows the depths of the terrible age-old hatred of the Jew. What is so shocking about this is that it took place in Johannesburg, and Falazzi was not actually taking a stand there. She did not step into the international affairs arena, even to advocate for Israel. She simply said she was a friend of Israel. Is that to say because you are a friend of Israel that you are de facto an enemy of the Palestinians? Of course not. Friends of Israel and friends of Palestinians can coexist, and in many parts of the world they do coexist. We now know, however, that in South Africa, with its own troubled past, 
is not one of those places. Also, no Jew can support boy boycott, divestment, and sanctions, the BDS movement, and support Israel at the same time. It's just impossible. Jews who support BDS are not in a policy dispute with Israel, and there is nothing Israel can do to alter their point of view. Their desire to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel is part of a strategy to hurt all Jews in Israel, not just settlers. That is not to say that one can't disagree with the official Israeli politics or politicians or decisions of the sitting prime minister. But there is a range of acceptable political discussion that is part and parcel of normal dialogue in politics, and BDSers far exceed that range. There are many, for example, who reject settlement policy. They have the right and even the responsibility to articulate that point of view. Israel, and for that matter, the Jewish community around the world are stronger because of that interaction and dialogue. BDS and groups like BDS are different. They are about hatred, pure, unadulterated hatred of Israel. Jews are part of uh, all of those groups. These Israel haters believe that Israel is the problem, and the problem would be solved if only Israel disappeared. They believe that Israel has no right to exist because the Jewish state abuses the Palestinians. BDS and others identify settlers and settlements as the weapons that abuse the Palestinians. They believe that because Israelis went to the polls and elected the current government, all, Israelis, all Israel facilitated the policy, and so all Israel is responsible. And that is why the BDS movement aims to boycott all things Israel, not simply products from the settlements. And then they take it a step further. They are not merely anti-Israel, they are anti-Semitic. They wrap their hatred of Jews into their dispute over Israeli policy. Not to recognize the raison d'etre of BDS, wiping Israel off the face of the map, off the face of the earth or off the map itself, is not to understand BDS. And that is why it is so surprising, so reprehensible, so hurtful, so insidious to see the recent rise in the numbers of Jewish anti-Israel supporters. Ignorance is, in this case, dangerous. Unaware, uninformed, and truly impartial observers who see Jews towing the BDS line might be duped into thinking there is credence to their point of view. Unfortunately of late, we are witnessing more and more Jews articulating, articulating this virulent anti-Israel stance. It is present not only in BDS, but in groups like Jewish Voice for Peace and Black Lives Matter. There is a long history of self-hating Jews. Theodor Herzl called these Jews disguised anti-Semites of Jewish origin. The great Jewish historian Bernard Wasserstein preferred the term Jewish anti-Semites to self-hating Jews. He argued that these Jews were not hateful of themselves. Rather, they hated the traits, behavior, and character of typical Jews. Extending the argument today, these Jews hate the political policies of other Jews, of mainstream Jewish communities, of the Israeli community, of Israeli politics. Their argument is very simple. The very act of living in Israel or supporting Israel is immoral by virtue of the fact that Israel stole the land from Palestinian Arabs. This hatred and the attack that accompanies it is not like the age-old disputes between Jewish communities, the conflicts between German Jews and Eastern European Jews, or the conflicts between Jews of North African descent and European Jews. They were civil by comparison. Destruction of the other was never even a consideration, let alone a desired end product of an animus. In 1263, in the town of Barcelona, for four days, July 20th to the 24th, Pablo Cristiani debated the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, in one of the most famous of public disputations of the Middle Ages. The debate was held in the king's court under the protection of King James I of Aragon. Pablo Cristiani was a particularly capable arguer for Christianity. He was a Jew who had converted to become a Dominican friar. He knew the inside story and the secrets of the Talmud as well as the rabbinic and biblical discourse, and he wielded that insider knowledge as a tool to dispute the Ramban. Had Pablo not been a learned Jew, he would never have had the insight or skill to mount such a serious debate. Today, BDSers attack, and they assert, their attack asserts this very same thing. They say that their standing within the Jewish community and the Jewish world is particularly because they are Jewish and that their Judaism requires them to promote this anti-Israel stance. As was the case in Barcelona in 1263, the only way to succeed in the debate against this group of Jews who hate Jews is by proving how wrong they are. 
they do not represent Jewish values. Convince the world that these Jews are not discussing policy differences. Make the argument that Israel is imperfect and has blemishes, but Israel is also moral and ethical. That, in fact, Israel is one of the most moral and ethical countries in the world. And that, most important of all, Israel is here to stay. And no amount of self-hatred, public embarrassment, will convince Israel to pack up and plunge into the sea. Coming up, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. I want to talk about two columns today. Both are from the New York Post. They appeared on successive days, and as is the norm, they each appeared online the day before they appeared in print. The first column is by Eugene Kontrarovitz. He is the international law director at the Kohelet Policy Forum in Jerusalem. The piece addresses the essential point that U.S. tax money is going to U.N. agencies that violate the conditions set out by congressional law. The law is very clear about where U.S. monies can go in the United Nations. And if there is even a hint of anti-Israel bias, the monies must be stopped. Congress enacted these laws because of the anti-Israel attitudes in the United Nations bodies. Congress said, we will not pay for this if you propagate anti-Semitism. Simple as that. The column appears in the New York Post on July 19th and July 20th. Kantorovich begins. Last month, two UN agencies whose membership is limited to the sovereign countries gave a member state seat to the Palestinian Liberation Organization under a law passed with overwhelming and bipartisan support in Congress over two decades ago. That means these UN bodies can no longer get taxpayer funding. Yet US contributions continue, along with money to two other UN organizations the Palestinians joined in recent years. Now Kantorovich gets into the details, the numbers and the law. He says, continuing to pay a total of 40 million a year for these agencies flouts U.S. law and undermines American credibility. Ambassador Nikki Haley has been commendably press pressing the U.N. for reform. But Turtle Bay may sneer at such demands if the U.S. isn't even following its own legally mandated restrictions. Moreover, it encourages the Palestinian Authority to continue its campaign of internationalizing the conflict. The law bars any congressionally appropriated money from going to UN agencies that accept the PLO as a member state. It seeks to deter the PLO from using the UN, where it enjoys an automatic majority of support to purport to confer upon it the status of a sovereign state that, in turn, would be used by the Palestinians to present Israel with a diplomatic fait accompli and completely remove any pressure on the Palestinians to make any compromises. Kantorovich shows that the UN is a vehicle for Palestinian recognition. He writes, once the Palestinians join such organizations, they hijack their agendas, and they turn these organizations already heavily biased against Israel into platforms for nakedly anti-Semitic agendas. Kantorovich explains that normally these laws have a relief. They have a waiver for the president to sign so they don't, go into the, uh, into the, they don't get in the way of the White House agenda and policies. But he writes, and here's the quote, Congress made the law non-waivable for good reasons. It understood there would always be a lobby against pulling the plug on U.S. agencies. That's a question that should be directed at Ramallah and the OPCW, the Organization for Protection Against Chemical Weapons. They knew full well what the U.S. law requires in such a circumstance and flouted it anyway. The countries that urged Abbas to pursue its U.N. membership blitz should be the ones that pick up the tab of 18 million a year, a drop in the bucket by European foreign aid standards. Kantorovich concludes with a suggestion and a solution. Find a different vehicle to help, he writes. And there are other ways to promote these goals without running the money through UN organizations. If preventing chemical weapons in Syria is the goal, America's savings from defunding the Hague-based OPCW could be better used to give Israel Air Force a credit on its next F-35. Next up is also a column from the New York Post, published the day before, online on July 18th and in print on July 19th. The column is written by Seth Lipsky. Lipsky is one of the greats. He was at the forward until the fallout and then created the New York Sun, which is online still. I used to call the Sun the Daily Jewish Week. The culture and social sections were the what's what and who's who in the Jewish world. This piece from the Post is entitled Chuck's Thorn. Will Schumer drop Israel for Ocasio-Cortez. Lipsky identifies a series of issues 
that the establishment Dems must be struggling with. The new candidate from New York for Congress, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who upset an incumbent and is the darling of the younger new voters, does not toe the traditional Dem line, especially on Israel. Will they, or in this case, the senior senator from New York, abandon Israel for the young up-and-coming candidate and grab the momentum of the youth vote? Or will he stay the course and continue his support for Israel? Lipsky begins. What will Chuck Schumer do if he has to choose between the Democrats and Israel? The question begs for an answer with the rise of the party's new it politician, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is the Democratic Socialist who toppled Joe Crowley in the Democratic primary in New York's 14th Congressional District. She is the nightmare for the Jewish state. No one's arguing Israel is the only or even primary issue before Congress, nor is Schumer the only Democrat of the ilk whose more centrist policies are being challenged by Ocasio-Cortez. Schumer, though, has spent a career presenting himself as Israel's greatest defender. How is Schumer going to protect that brand if Ocasio-Cortez wins in November? Even the liberal Israeli daily Haaretz reports that Ocasio-Cortez is seen as the embodiment of the Democrats shifting away from Israel. It's not hard to see why. Lipsky now describes a little of Ocasio-Cortez's point of view. Ocasio-Cortez's progression on the issue of Israel is shocking. She jumped right in, bashing Israel's handling of the attacks from Gaza, characterizing Israel's defense as a massacre. On Friday, Ocasio-Cortez was asked about that on firing line with Margaret Hoover. The young socialist claimed she supports a two-state solution, then went on about the occupation of Palestine. Ocasio-Cortez talked of an increasing crisis of humanitarian condition, adding that is just where I tend to come from on this issue. Hoover asked what she meant by the occupation of Palestine. Oh, um, Ocasio-Cortez stumbled. She then complained about settlements before confessing that she is, quote, not the expert on geopolitical on this issue. Two days later, Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! asked Ocasio-Cortez whether she still believed in the two-state solution. The Bronx Socialist backpedaled, saying she's consulting with activists. If you ask me if it was not so serious and not so sad, it would be hilarious. Consult an activist? Who consults activists? What kind of leader consults activists? They should consult experts. They may have been activists in an earlier part of their lives, these experts, but activists are not going to give you background. They're going to give you a solution to their problem. Now Lipsky begins to wrap up by saying Schumer and other Dems are pretty safe, but this trend is very serious. He writes, which gets back to the question of Schumer. All sorts of Democrats are sounding the alarm. They seem to get what Ocasio-Cortez's pseudo-Marxist agenda represents for the party. They range from uh, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Congressman uh, Alcee Hastings of Florida, Meteor's fizz out, to Bill Pascrell of New Jersey. She ain't going to make friends, to name a few. Few Democrats are marking Ocasio-Cortez's denigration of Israel. So far, it looks like Schumer is taking a powder, just as he did on the Obama administration's appeasement of Iran. It may not be so easy to hide from the movement of which Ocasio-Cortez is a part. Another major centrist Democrat, Dianne Feinstein, is fighting for her political life against the Californian radical. Lipsky also says Schumer needs to make his position known clearly because it will impact his larger political career options. Lipsky concludes, Israel might not figure in the California race. In New York, it's another story. If a high-profile Democratic critic of Israel accedes to the House from New York, how will it look if Schumer failed to speak up? Next up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to discuss one cartoon today. It's a pictoon. There is a mother and a child who are depicted in a classic early 1960s photo. The mother is berating her daughter about lying and telling the truth. The mother says to her young child, if you keep on lying, you will grow up to be a reporter for CNN. This is one of the funniest political cartoons I've seen in a very, very long time. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. I'm reminded of the story of Chicken Little shouting, the sky is falling. Iranian leadership is shouting that Israel is stealing Iranian rain and snow clouds. 
Cloud theft, according to Iran, is the result of Western oppression of Iran. In the press conference, Brigadier General Ghulam Reza Jalili, head of Iran's civil defense organization, is quoted as saying, foreign interference is suspected to have played a role in climate change and is insisting that results from an Iranian scientific study confirm this claim. It's weird. He said, quote, Israel and another country in the region have joint teams which work to ensure clouds entering Iranian skies are unable to release rain. Jalali continued, on top of that, we are facing the issue of cloud and snow theft, citing a survey showing that above 2,200 meters, all mountains in the areas between Afghanistan and the Mediterranean are covered in snow except Iran. Iranians' meteorological service experts disagree. The head of Iran's meteorological service, Ahad Vazifi, was quoted as saying on ISNA, an official Iranian news service, he said the following, General Jalali probably has documents of which I am not aware, but on the basis of meteorological knowledge, it is not possible for a country to steal snow or clouds. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Wind. I want to speak about wind. Because of the balloons and kites from Gaza, wind has been a major factor. This provides a good excuse to discuss winds. In Hebrew, the word is ruach, but it's hardly that simple. Ruach is also spirit. It also means breath. It is also a synonym for Hashem, for God. Or better even, it is a, certainly used as to mean God's manifestation on earth and in human beings. Ruach is grammatically a feminine word, and in the plural, the word is ruchot. In Aramaic, the word is rucha, and it's feminine. In Greek, it's pneuma. It's the word which is neither masculine or feminine in Greek. The word ruach is used 389 times in the Jewish Bible and in the Tanakh, and the majority deal with God and not the wind. For instance, 136 mentions deal with God, while 129 deal with humans. And then the remainder deal with wind blowing. But even then, it's connected with God. Like in Genesis, when the wind blows through the Garden of Eden, the actual line is, God walked through the garden during a breezy time of the day in Genesis 3.2. Or when the wind comes during the splitting of the Red Sea in Exodus 14.21, a strong east wind divided the sea and dried it up or the strongest east wind that brought the locusts in Exodus 10, 13, and the 10 plagues. In these cases, it is clearly wind, but it is certainly an act of God. Ruach is one of those great words in Hebrew. It means so much given the context and usage. Ruach also means, uh, it can mean mean, it can mean courage, it can mean anger, it can mean wrath. Ruach is also, it can mean inspired. But of course, ruach can also and does simply mean wind. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.